see quite a gang here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the transactional messaging patterns part two. Um, if you missed part one, that's okay. If you feel like you're a little bit out of the context, we will do a bit of a recap. Um, and um, today's session will be a bit of a, maybe a non-standard non one, right? We will look through a lots of code and um, I would like to uh, make the session as interactive as possible. So um, if you feel like you have a comment or you have a question or you'd like to discuss some specific use case or whatnot, uh, please don't hesitate to bring that up. Even if we don't manage to cover all the ground by the end of this presentation, I'd like this to be as useful for you guys as possible. And um, um, I think that if at some point you feel like, okay, I need some more context or I need some, you know, um, like a couple of hours uh, of discussion about details, uh, just feel free to, you know, to contact me. I will provide the contact details and the end, at the end of this meeting. All right, so um, let's move on and, uh, you know, start with the recap. Um, so during a previous session, we discussed um, a few interesting things like loose coupling, event-driven and message-driven architectures, Kafka basics, and transactional log tailing with an example of Microsoft SQL Server and uh, the change data capture on top of it, which is quite a lot. So again, if you have missed something out, um, please go ahead and, and you know, uh, I encourage you to look through the part one. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with something or see and you know, um, or can correct me at some uh, in, in some of the aspects of either of the presentations, please do. I'd love to hear from you. All right, but like that's what we talked about. Um, and now, like I know that we like two weeks from the first session, so I wouldn't be surprised if someone were to say, "What change data capture? What the hell is that?" Right? So I'd like to do a recap on this specifically because it's quite important. So we talked about this um, and um, during previous session, and I said that. Um, in, I think, 2020, uh, January 1st, um, an engineer called Gunnar, Gunnar Morling, um, it's a lead engineer for Debezium project, made a talk at QCon conference where he discussed this approach of how do you, how do you get your data from, uh, from a storage, right, from some kind of persistent storage like a relational database uh, or a file system or, um, or NoSQL, right, um, to the uh, to the Kafka, right, to Kafka topics. And that's the diagram you can see on the left um, that he presented, which is in his example, what he had is uh, a CRM service, which you can think of like any writer to your database. Is it a monolithic application or is it uh, something like service-oriented architecture where different components share the persistent storage uh, or even a microservice with a local storage, which you'd like to get to Kafka. Um, but that, that, that specific use case, we should probably discuss a bit more later. Um, and um, so the flow of the data is, okay, I do have a, uh, a CRM service in this example, right? It writes data to the, uh, to the database and I want to get this data to the Kafka topics. So the approach he suggested was using change data capture and then using Kafka connect with Divisium connector that would take care of getting the data uh, which is change data capture uh, from the database to the Kafka topics. Now that's a lot of moving parts, right? Um, there is obviously Kafka with all the topics, brokers, zookeepers, partitions, and so on, right? There is Kafka Connect, which is a separate infrastructure uh, consideration for you um, that you can use for, you know, getting the data uh, to Kafka topics, for example from various sources and a Debezium connector, which is dedicated piece of software uh, that you could use in order to uh, integrate with the uh, various data sources. Um, but I'd like to also, you know, focus on what the change data capture is, right? So if you work with a relational database, what happens is whatever the operation is you're doing on top of the database, um, gets recorded to the log, right? That's what you can see in, in, on the uh, picture on the right. So what happens is you are recording like the, every committed transaction goes to the log. Now the SQL server has this feature called change data capture, 
which is basically a capture process on top of the database engine, right? And it tails the transactional log um, and simply writes a set of changes that um, happened and were recorded to the log to a separate set of tables in, in a different schema. So technically, what this does is a pattern called transactional log tailing. It, you simply read through the log, through the transactional log, and show the historical states and changes for all the rows in the tables that you are tracking. This is quite interesting because you can make an audit of every single change that you made on the database, no matter what is the process that made them, right? Now, with this approach, we, we, we looked at that previously, and um, I'm going to show that uh, uh, li running live again. Uh, but I'd like to make another step forward, which is let's go to the code base and see how, how that looks like. And uh, um, we, can, we can see how we can get the, uh, the events streaming, right? So let me switch to my terminal and um, um, let's do, yeah, that should be fine. Tie, whoops, tie run. For those who missed part one, um, during this demo, I'm using a few uh, tools that you won't typically find on your projects. One of those is Project Tie. This is an experimental tool that um, some of the Microsoft devs are working on. It's open source, if I recall correctly. Um, and what it does, it's simply, uh, you can think of it as a, like the basic use case is that's good way of doing Docker Compose without thinking images um, and for, for, uh, for the .NET projects. Um, I am though using a few custom images that I have built um, and I'm going to show that in a moment too. All right, um, let me see what do I have in the dashboard. So this is a Thai dashboard, which is, uh, let me see, do we have it running? We should. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong URL. Right. So here is the dashboard, right? And uh, it lists a bunch of services that I have spinned up, right? Um, I do have here a monolithic database, which stands for you know, your relational database that you want to uh, get the data from to the Kafka topics. Um, I do have a Kafka infrastructure here, which is Kafka Zookeeper, Kafka Broker, two of them actually. Um, I also am using Kafka Connect that um, has a plugging of Debezium connector on top of it. Um, I have two applications. One is Inventory API. This is a simple um, gRPC service that um, I am using to simply doing CRUD up for simply doing CRUD operations on top of the um, monolithic database right here. And the data gen, that's a console application that uh, talks to the Inventory API and randomly generates creations and updates to the database or semi-randomly. Um, and the last one is this configurator container. So this guy is responsible for setting up the database, uh, setting up the schema and uh, enabling change data capture and so on and so forth. I won't go deeper into this. We discussed it a little bit um, during our previous session. Um, but what's important is that I want to give you a proof that this uh, change data capture works before we move on. Um, which is, let's take this control data center. This is basically this URL, right? Confluent Control Center. This is another tool made by a company called Confluent, uh, who's uh, one of the primary contributors to Kafka. And so here you'll see a bunch of Kafka topics listed. There are 44 or four of them, but if you take a look at this list, right, you will notice just a few, which is like the justification for it. There is a bunch of internal topics that we don't really care for the sake of this demo. Now you can see two topics called DBO engines and DBO vehicles. What that is, is again, a bit of a reminder of a previous session we have in our SQL Server database right here, uh, which we spinned up two tables, one called engines, the other one of vehicles. And so what we do is we are taking data about changes in those two tables to these two topics. How do we take them? Again, a quick reminder, I'm going to do a, a new query and I'm going to, um, Okay, select all from cdc.dbo um, 
underscore engines, for example, underscore CT, and um, whoops, and let's see what I can get from it. If my SQL server is still live. Oh, come on, don't do that on me. <laughs> While it's trying to figure out what's what's with the resources happening there, let's take a look if we do have any messages. Right, so what I'm looking right now um, into is my Kafka topic called dbserver.dbo.engines. That's where my change data capture goes in, right? And I'm specifically looking at partition zero. I do have a few more of them, like five partitions here. So you'll notice some of the messages in partition one, some of the messages in partition two, um, and so on, right? Um, okay, let me try to reconnect. Connection, whoops. Nope. Um, and I want to close that too and get to my local SQL server again. Oh, I do have a chance to show you one interesting bug which I stumbled upon. So this bug is in the SQL server if you ever see this in logs of the SQL server, the best choice you have is to basically reboot that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop this guy. This is, by the way, one of the knowledge base um, articles and issues for the SQL server. And I'm going to start it back. Okay, now we should be fine. Let's try connect again. All right. Use inventory. Ah, again, sorry for that. Here we are. All right, so this is a content of the change tracking table for engines, right? You can see the um, list of crypt, like a set of cryptic columns, like the start LSN, end LSN, sequence value, and so on and so forth. If you look through this, you'll notice that here you'll see every single change that happened to every single row uh, since the moment that the CDC was enabled. And the start LSN is basically the uh, commit LSN that you're looking at. Now, the operation here, again, this is basically an enumeration. You'll see this is before update, this is after update. If you ever see something like two, this is a creation, which should be somewhere at the beginning. Um, I think um, since, I, yeah, here, this is a creation of a record and so on. So this allows us to find out the state of the row at any single point of time and all the changes that happened through, through the history since we have enabled change data capture. So um, we can get all of that into the Kafka topics uh, using Debezium as mentioned earlier. And you will notice that a lot of the data about the payload, the transaction transactional time here, <clears throat> and the operation uh, which happened on top of the row are here, as well as the state of the row before and after. So you can notice here value.payload.after and there is actually rest, which is manufacturer. It's an attribute on the row. So this gives you the state of the value after the transaction, right? So that's nice and all, 
but this gives us change data capture. How do we work with this? Why would we ever um, try to, to do that, right? So let's take a look at some of the use cases. Um, that's what, what we did so far, right? That's our data gen, the API going to monolithic database, then Kafka Connect, Debezium on top of it, and then two Kafka topics. But wh why would we ever use that? So frequently you would try to consume these messages and you would just try to project them onto something like a domain entity or an aggregate route in terms of domain driven design, or just transform or retrieve data somehow and just store it for a future use. Like, um, I just want to stash all of that into some table and um, you know, be able to do an audit uh, in a different part of my system, which is not relying on the same, um, on the same persistent storage from which I took this data. So like you could try to arrange a, um, uh, an auditing uh, based on this, or you can try to get this data to the, to the data warehouse and do the reporting on top of it and many more use cases. But um, in this, like in, in these use cases, it's probably sufficient to just apply the transformation on the go and write it to the database or whatever the the, the source, uh, sorry, the target persistent storage is. Um, or you can even, you know, keep it in the Kafka topic forever with uh, turning off the uh, retention policy on it. But the question that I have for you, and I suggest you to think of it, and maybe you know, if, if we have someone that um, uh, you know has experience with it or can think of uh, some edge cases, um, what would be the consequence of failure if if we are using Kafka as a message broker? And what I mean by that is a failure to say writing to the database. So, let's say I have consumed the event right from the Kafka topic, and I failed to write it to the database. Um, so how did like this is one of the important questions to consider whenever you're consuming from any kind of message broker so if any one of you guys have experience with that or try to work specifically with kafka with this uh, with the consumption from kafka i'd love to hear from you of what kind of um concerns you would uh you would think uh during the consumption anyone not Kafka, but probably we can stick to some decision like we use, for example, like dead letter queues, etc. You know, when you can't consume it, you put it to a separate queue or something like that called dead queue, and then uh, process it in with uh, uh, as a separate uh, messages or events. Nice. And this dead letter queue processing would that be a uh... An automated thing, or uh, would you use some kind of a semi-manual approach? <laughs> There's no way to build it automatically because you don't know the reason why uh, it wasn't processed. So of course that will require additional uh, attention. Nice. All right. Um, and how about like if I if I consumed an event about some fact that happened and I failed to process it, and so I put that event to a dead letter queue. What if I get another another event um, that relates to the same entity? Should it go to the dead letter queue, or should I try to um, to consume that and process it again? Mm. <laughs> so, uh, good question. Actually, mm, I think the approach could be the same. So you try to process it if. It could be processed, then you process it. If no, again, put to the letter queue, but it depends on business logic. So if that is kind of single not operation or like, let's say transaction, so you should stop processing after first uh, wasn't processed, then of course you cannot proceed. So it depends. Good, that's, that's a very good answer. A few things that I'd like to add to this is, Sure, you can put the, the, the event that you have failed to project to the dead letter queue, right? And try to process another one. And you can you know, even succeed with processing the other one and just then do an audit of the dead letter queue and maybe discard or compensate for the failed events, right? That's one of the options. For some use cases though, um, if it matters uh, for your business, right? 
um, it might be a better idea to say, okay, I wasn't able to process a prior event that relates to this particular entity. So if I ever get another event, I should put that to the deadletter queue if there is something for that entity again, right? And then try to reprocess uh, all of these events later on because ordering might matter. The other case is, okay, if I can't process, I can just stop processing messages at all. This one is interesting and also might work for some use cases. Um, however, usually, especially if you're working with a large, um, large amount of data, right? And for large enterprise uh, company with uh, needs of, you know, maintaining um, operations for multiple clients, this would probably not be the case, especially if your message broker um, is responsible for uh, working with messages for various clients, right? You can't just stop consuming because this automatically means a stream stock. So like you, you stop processing for everyone if a single entity is failing, which is probably not the greatest uh, strategy, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I, I hear your point. I want to suggest you two options. One we will see during the, the um, code demo, right? The other one, um, I'd like, which is related to the dead queue, I'd like to hear more about that from you guys as we proceed through the code base uh, um, and why this dead letter queue approach might work better than what I'm going to show you. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's about the uh, consequences of the failure, right? But the even more interesting, at least to me and challenging, um, would be the use case when you're trying to consume multiple events or messages from different topics or different sources, if we are not talking Kafka specifics, and try to aggregate them into something that has um, has a meaning in terms of domain entities, for example, right? So in our example, we said we do have a table of vehicles and we do have a table of engines. So what I want to get um, out of, of this whole thing, right? Um, I want to aggregate together um, engine and the vehicle into a single entity and produce it to a different Kafka topic so that other services could use it. This could be quite uh, useful, specifically if you're working uh, in the team that is responsible for integration across multiple, um, uh, say, multiple applications, services, even, even uh, you know, maybe even cloud providers, uh, maybe even different companies. Um, that's quite a challenging thing to do though, um, because of the fact that you're working with events, which means automatically eventual consistency. You're working with, um, uh, if, if we are talking Kafka and multi-partitioned topics, you're working with the use case when depending on your st strategy on the partitioning, you might be consuming events out of order for the aggregate. So like if, for some reason, say uh, my vehicle is, uh, you know, something that needs two engines for for some reasons. Like let's say it's uh, it's a plane, right? And uh, let's say it needs like two engines or whatnot. That doesn't really matter. Or two other kinds of parts, right? Um, and uh, one of those parts goes like events about one of those parts goes into one partition, and events about the second one goes to the second partition. I don't have a guarantee of ordering when I'm consuming that, right? So there are a lot of interesting challenges when you're trying to aggregate data from multiple sources, especially if the ordering is not a guarantee. So let's talk a little bit more about the aggregation. Um, and I would like to suggest you a list of things to think through whenever you have to work with something like this. Um, and it's not an exhaustive list. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, out of order processing is one of the most important things you have to think about. How do you, uh, how are you going to uh, work with events if you can't guarantee the ordering? Um, the other thing is nullification events. If we are working with an aggregate and we are aggregating like uh, two or, or let's, for the sake of simplicity, say two different um, kinds of events, right? And one is considered as a parent thing for the other. So what happens if you get a delete for the parent uh, in the eventually consistent world, right? You do not have a guarantee that you actually consumed everything that could have happened to the children. So what do you do? Do you emit a deleted event 
uh, do you not emit anything? Do, do you wait until uh, other events arrive for the children? Do you have a guarantee that they will ever arrive, right? How long do you wait? Tons of questions. Because like if, if, if these, especially if uh, the, uh, these two kinds of entities live in different data sources or in different tables and they didn't have some uh, lacking consistency constraints in the source database, right? Um, so this is far from trivial and depending on your business needs, you'll have a different solution for almost every use case you work on. The other thing is race conditions. Um, what if um, my consumption, again, this is closely uh, tied to um, out of order processing. Like what if one of my consumers is working faster than the other? What if um, I'm one of my consumers failed and the other not, right? What if I'm processing in two different uh, containers or two different replicas of the same service um, and I managed to work in one of them faster than the other? Um, the, the, the way to, to think of it is, okay, if I have race conditions, I should probably apply some kind of locking, which means that you have to think now about lock contentions, right? And uh, uh, obviously eventual consistency. Um, the, the other important thing is item potency, because what if I try to uh, replay all the events on the topic again? Um, and that might be um, useful, in, especially in case if you're trying to onboard a late arriving consumer for the same topic. You can never expect that you're the only consumer for a particular topic because you're working with a loosely coupled world where every time someone wants to build up a new component of the system, they should be capable of using the same topics uh, that are already there and maybe some more. Um, and many, many others. As I said earlier, this list doesn't, uh, is not exhaustive, right? So it's not all the things that you have to be worried about. But those are, from my personal experience, the most complex questions that you'll have to answer before you actually you know, embark on this journey. So um, I'm going to give you another problem to think of. Um, and please bear with me. We'll get to the code base quite soon. So the problem is, OK, let's say we have let's say we did the aggregation, okay? Somehow we consumed events. Uh, we do have an entity in memory that now holds all the data. And I want to you know, write it to the local storage for the durability uh, sake, right? And I also want to publish an event that this entity was created, updated or deleted. Let's try to, you know, to limit ourselves to the basic CRUD events. Um, so how do I do this at the same time? How do I reliably update the state in my local database, right? And send this message to a message broker. Let's, let's say it's Kafka in our case, but it might be anything else. Um, things to consider when thinking about this problem is what do we do first? Like, do we write to the database or do we produce a message to the broker, right? Uh, what if first write fails? What if second write fails? but the first succeeds. What if I just retry on the failures? Does anyone have a good suggestion on how to answer these questions? Mm, not a good, but just question, uh, just answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for instance, if we decide to write to a database first and then produce message, the consumer of that message could uh, have additional verification for existence in a database before processing the message and vice versa. Okay, wouldn't it tie the uh, uh, consumer to your producer, to your publisher? Yeah, it will do, but... Uh, so, it, so it kind of defeats the purpose, right? We are trying to make it in a loose, couple, loose coupled manner, right? Loosely coupled manner. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it, it depends on... Uh, uh, if consistency is really, really, really uh, high important, so you have to do that. For example, that is finance or something like that, where you lose money, etc. If you don't add that verification, if it's not so important, of course, uh, there should be other cases how to fix it. So that. Okay. So I the, the good point from this that I have as a you know as a lesson learned for me personally is okay how important the consistency is like is it critical to lose one of the messages 
And the answer might be no. Like if we are working with, uh, I don't know, whatever, maybe we're just streaming data from the IoT devices and it's not that critical to lose something. If we lose like 1% of messages, it's, you know, it's still a valuable product. It still gives us um, value on the market. It doesn't get your, like, it doesn't defeat the purpose of the product, right? So th that's one of the important questions that uh, we should talk about with our product managers when we work on the software. Like how, how important is it to be consistent, at least eventually? And how important it to be eventually consistent all the time? Like, what if we lose something? Anyone else? None. Okay. So here's what I want to suggest to you. The answer is actually in the, in the name of the slide, right? Um, but the solution is um, basically transactional outbox and polling, polling publisher patterns. Um, what what they are, except like apart from the fancy names, is transactional outbox is saying, okay, I'm not going to try, like ideally, if I could have a transaction that makes right to both relational database and a message broker atomic, like it's either everything or nothing, that would be great, right? But this is not going to happen. That's not something you could do uh, um, and not something you can do always. Of course, you can try to build up your custom distributed transaction and try to, uh, you know, to, to make this happen. But likely, even if it works, it will be too slow, okay? So um, the answer is, what if we just say, we are going to write the state and the payload that we want to send to the message broker within a single transaction to the same storage, to the same database? Okay, so now I have in my database both the state and the payload that I want to send. And then the polling publisher is, uh, you can think of it as a background thread or a different service or, or a different process even that um, doesn't really matter what, 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 which one of them. But point is, this is something that would regularly poll your database and try to find out those um, those payloads that you have written in the uh, uh, as a part of your transactional outbox to your database right and then we will just try to get the the uh, outbox payloads and publish them to the message broker important consideration though we should publish like we should make sure that we are publishing in order this is super important because otherwise your consumers just can't use this data like they will have to solve almost impossible problem of reordering. Let me rephrase this. The problem is solvable, but you don't want to go to that kind of complexity. Um, point is, if you don't publish in order, you're just saying, hey, here is a whole mass of data. You sort it out, which complicates lives of the consumers for, that, uh, for, for these messages, right? Um, so publishing has to be in order. So the takeaway here is two things. In order to build the aggregation that I man mentioned earlier, um, what we would have to do apart from consuming change data capture events and assembling the state of my aggregate, we would have to use transactional outbox to write both the state of the aggregate and the payload that I want to publish to the message broker as a message to the, t to the database within a single transaction and then we want to have some kind of background worker that would uh, go to this database and see if there is any work that has to do. And uh, if any, then order it and produce these messages to the broker. Any, uh, I hope you're following me right now. If you don't, let's talk about this. Otherwise, let's switch to the code base. Any questions? ideas, concerns about this? Maybe someone worked with this approach. None, okay. So let's go back to the code. Um, before we take a look at how the consumption would work for, for our service, I'd like to show you a few utils um, that we're going to use. 
and again, this is a demo application. By no means it's production ready, so please don't don't judge me too hard. Um, here is the utils project that I have in my solution. And the reason I want to focus right now on this is that I'm, I'm going to set up a few patterns that I want to use uh, during other step all of the demo. The first one would be the background worker. This is a fairly simple thing. Um, it's a background service, right? But it's a generic one, and it takes a generic parameter of T work item. What the work item is, um, for the sake of this demo, we will consider the work items uh, as a indication of planned work, okay? So the work item contract is fairly simple, is just a unique identifier, and it's um, a process timestamp, which is, in this case, it's long, so I'm going to use milliseconds from Unix epoch, um, and uh, retry counter plus the next retry UTC timestamp, which is also long. I will get back to these guys a bit later. Now, when we talk about uh, this, these longs and why the timestamps are in longs, um, Again, this is my personal preference. I find it easier to work with um, this kinds of uh, timestamps um, rather than using date times or, uh, or timestamps or whatnot, um, specifically because of the conversion of, this, of the time zones. So um, in my personal opinion, the backend contract in majority of cases could be we are always working with the UTC timestamps and in order to get rid of some implicit conversions between time zones that we can you know that you can that you will find out only when something bad happens um, we would just store them as longs so that none of the um, tools or or database engines or whatever else we are using uh, are trying to convert uh, to assume what kind of time zone we are talking about and try to convert them into something else, okay? So that's the work item, it, it, it work items contract. It just says, I do have a unique identifier, so you can, you can um, identify me somehow, and um, I do have um, something for retries, something that indicates that I did the processing. Now, let's talk about what this background worker does. This is a simple background service. What it does is, Every time that it, it gets spinned up within a simple try catch, it builds a work item batch context. I'll describe that in more details in a few moments. And then it awaits a pipeline. Um, I will show that as a pattern uh, in a moment too. Within the pipeline, what this does, it says, I'm going to resolve the context from the pipeline's um, uh, lifetime scope. Who's not familiar with that? The lifetime scope is an artifact uh, construct, which is, you can think of it as a, as a inversion of control container, okay? It's just a child scope of the container. Um, if you didn't work with Autofact, by the way, I would recommend looking into that. It's quite interesting. And uh, in my personal opinion, one of the best ISC containers that you can find right now. Um, now, we would take the scope, this lifetime scope, which is our ISC container, and we will also resolve a an, something that implements iWork item batch uh, handler of T work item, right? So this is something that knows how to handle batches of work items of a certain type. And we will call a method handle on top of it. What happens inside of it, we don't really care in, in, in the scope of the worker. If something fails, like an operation canceled exception, we just log in information and exit. If there is an handled exception, which was propagated to this level, all we can do is log critical um, and, and just stop processing whatever. And then if um, uh, in other cases, right, you could, uh, you could have, uh, uh, like, let me rephrase this, this line of code would never ever happen except when you got to these guys. Now, with all this being said, um, let's take a look at what the pipeline is. That's the unknown so far uh, and what this work item batch context is. So this work item batch context um, is a simple class that has a worker name and has a batch work item here uh, and the stopping token. Um, the batch work item is simply a collection and immutable list of the work items. That's it, nothing more than that. Now, the pipeline is more interesting. Um, 
I hope that at least some of you worked with uh, middlewares. Anyone? No? Okay. Do you at least know the concept? Like maybe you have worked with um, uh, with IIS earlier, you have some experience with it, uh, or maybe you tried to uh, use middlewares with uh, ASP.NET Core. No? Okay. I will try to give you a bit more details about what pipeline is. Someone wanted to say something? Uh, just, yeah, you're just asking me about experience with IOC Content. So uh, we actually use Lamar in that core application. Nice. Cool. So yeah, I also I was just trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Mute, mute button is so far away. <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm glad you found the, the unmute button, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, um, the pipeline here is using the similar concept, right? So um, I do have the pipeline in uh, my utils right here. And I'm not going to go through all of it, all of, all of the implementation of it, right? But it's basically an immutable step, stack of steps, okay? Every step you can, uh, it, basically when you construct the pipeline, you can define a set of steps that you want to, to take, right? And the innermost step is what you did in your background worker um, do right here. So this guy is innermost. And um, you can think of all the other steps as every step wraps everything within it. So you can control what happens before the next step and you can control what happens after the step, the, the next step, right? Um, how do I make this more explicit? Um, I'll try to um, give you an idea of what's happening here. So when we build a uh, pipeline, every time you do this uh, pipeline dot do or um, do with fallback, um, what will happen is I'll try to take the innermost action, which is what we had in this um, pipeline do, right? And I will take the stack of steps and unless it's empty, I'm going to pop from the stack, step one by one, and I will do the, like I will basically wrap the, the innermost action into this first step, right? And I will assign the the uh, to do right this to do variable to the result of it, and then I'm going to pop another one, and then I'm going to rub this to do action with another step, okay? And that that will move on until I'm done. This gives me an ability to say, okay, during execution of this pipeline, I'm going to have three steps, right? First step, for example, would be uh, you know ensuring that I have an ambient transaction, so. It will open a transaction scope before executing the next step. And it will automatically uh, complete the scope and exit from, from the, uh, and basically dispose the transaction scope um, after I'm done with, uh, with that next step in the pipeline, okay? Maybe before doing the ambient transaction in my pipeline, I want to in introduce another step, which is I want to, um, let's say, add a retry, like if, anything failed, uh, I want to try again. So I will define a retry policy. And within that policy, I will try to execute whatever the step is downstream the pipeline. And once, like if they fail, I want to catch that with my policy and you know try again. If this fails beyond the retry, max retry um, configuration that I have, I, I want to you know throw an exception or find a fallback or whatever. So typically this works as a middleware uh, where you can control what happens before the next step, uh, before the next middleware um, and what happens after is being executed. Um, this is quite interesting pattern and I lately use it a lot. Um, I would suggest you looking to that concept if you haven't yet. Um, it, in my personal opinion, it has a, it has a lot of, lots of possible usages and can work serve you well. So that's the pipeline, okay? Now I do have a few pipeline extensions, which is with retry forever. Um, that's what I'm going to use to make my background workers to work all the time, right? Uh, unless of course there is an exception. 
And um, um, this guy in work items batch context, what this will do is it will um, take the batch context that we have defined in the background worker right here on the top, right? And um, it will simply find um, the, uh, using this batch work item provider function from the parameter, it will hydrate the processing work items batch inside of the context. So that is how my how I'm going to hydrate the context with um, with the work items on every iteration. Um, let me try to be more explicit of how the pipeline steps will look like. Um, let's um, switch to the terminal for a second. Uh, let me shut the tie down. And while that is happening, let me do git status. And uh, I'm going to do git reset hard. And I'm going to do git checkout step six, I think, if I recall it correctly. Um, yeah, that's not really all the stuff that I need. So let's do step seven. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the code base again. Um, if you are not familiar with uh, Autofac, this is fine. I'll, I'm sure you'll notice a lot of similarities to um, other kinds of, uh, uh, other means of doing dependency injections and other kinds of inversion of control containers. But in, um, in my demo, I am using it a lot. Um, and uh, that's the, the, my choice of um, ISC container. And what I'm going to walk you through is, okay, we do have this program.cs, right? There is a lot of stuff going on. We do have configuration for uh, the application itself. We use uh, service provider factory, which is an artifact. Um, we configure gRPC and gRPC reflection. This, however, for the aggregator service is just something that I'm, I was planning to add for maybe part three um, of these talks, but um, we'll see how it goes. And then uh, we configure web host, right? Um, and we do the web builder dot, dot configure, right? Lots of stuff here. And the most important thing that we care about is this configure container. So in this configure container, um, this, these are a few background workers that we care about. Um, and the, the background worker that I showed you earlier will be used for aggregation. So let me show you what's going on in the Kafka background worker too. So the Kafka background worker, this guy, um, I'm using a uh, container, uh, the, uh, basically an extension method, right? So this will typically take a container builder and it will add to the container builder um, the, um, through the extension method, right? It will add a Kafka background worker that knows how to work with messages that have GUID key and uh, J object as a as a value of them uh, as as a message in, inside, right? And um, I am going to add uh, means of deserializing data, which is uh, I want to use the so-called DBZM deserializers, um, which are basically a JSON deserializer and a deserializer for the key that takes a string and finds there a key that. Um, I have in my, uh, basically a primary key of the, uh, of the row. Um, there is nothing fancy, just parsing of the JSON because the JSON is what we get from, from Kafka topic that it gets populated by Debezium. Um, I am con uh, also registering consumer options. Um, this is means of configuring your applications if you're not familiar with that. Um, and uh, uh, it will typically work well with uh, um, your environment variables, app settings, and other things, um, other configuration sources. And I'm adding Kafka consumer. So this guy is another extension method. What it does is it registers a consumer builder. This part, this is a part of uh, Confluent's um, Kafka SDK for .NET. Um, this guy is building for you a class that knows how to consume from a particular Kafka uh, cluster. Of course, you'll have to configure it specifically by providing him the API version, um, the broker version fallback, um, the security mechanisms and protocols. Uh, you'll have to tell him where to find the uh, Kafka brokers and Zookeeper. 
I think one broker is sufficient for the uh, initial negotiation, and then you can do the discovery later. Um, you will have to also supply a bunch of other uh, configuration values, like what is the consumer group ID? This one, by the way, is quite important because if you switch your consumer group ID, you will start consuming from scratch. If you keep your consumer ID the same, even if you tear down all your consumers and then bring them up, they will continue consuming from the same places where they left off. And there is a lot of other configurations that you can um, use for configuring your Kafka consumers um, and producers, by the way, too. You can find them in the official documentation. Um, if you want to reference, just let me know. I'll, um, I'll slack you the link. But point is, um, I'm going to um, build up a consumer for Kafka. I'm going to tell him how to find value and key deserializers from my autofac and I'm going to build this consumer builder. That's how I register Kafka consumer to the container. Okay, so that's adding Kafka consumer for, for the background worker. Now this guy is adding a default pipeline for CDC consumption. So remember I showed you the pipeline. Um, this simply adds a, uh, a pipeline with the uh, uh, with a generic parameter, which is consume result, that's a context for the pipeline, right? And uh, um, you can also configure it additionally if you need to. We are not going to do that. Um, but basically you could include to this pipeline something like resilience policies or additional steps like instrumentation and other things. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a Debezium message handler. This guy knows how to handle Debezium messages. And for that, um, I'm going to register an yet another pipeline. This pipeline is going to work with an abstraction on top of the consumer result from Kafka, which is called inbound event. This is something customly written. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. But this is basically an abstraction on top of what kind of message broker you work with, which says, I don't care as long as you can supply the key for the message, the the content of the message uh, or other type of the content. And in addition to that, tell me how do I know the offset of the message? How do I know the source of the message? And maybe something else. And then um, we will also do the, uh, we will also expose something that allows you to additionally configure the processing pipeline if needed, right? And this Debezium handler right here, uh, what this guy would do is it will take the inbound processing pipeline as a parameter to the constructor. And once we have the, the consumed result from Kafka, this guy is Confluent SDK again, we will just validate a bunch of things, right? And then we will convert it to the inbound event so that we can work with an, with an abstraction, right? And don't force all, everything in the code base to be uh, tied to the fact that we are working with the Kafka as a message broker. And then we would, start this in like we would execute within the inbound processing pipeline um, something called inbound event handler right and this inbound event handler is our Debezium CDC inbound event handler that we saw earlier so this guy does very simple thing it basically persists the inbound event and it also generates from the uh, from this event it generates work item. So the idea is quite simple. I want to have a pipeline so that I can control um, various concerns like resiliency policies or instrumentation, um, metrics, logging, and other things. I also want it to be um, something like a pipeline so that I could inject a, uh, a transaction scope into the pipeline and get it out of the handler itself. Like I want my handler to be to care only about the, the way to handle the message. And the handler itself, what it does is, I want to get the event from Kafka, I want to generate something that I can act upon later, and I want to put them both into the database and then just commit the offset. That will take care of, you know, you can think of it as, a, as an acknowledgement. So you as a consumer of Kafka, you're acknowledging to Kafka that you have read the event and you have acted upon it. 
So this would be step one of, of, uh, of the whole thing. We will consume the event and we will put the, the result of this event to the, to the, sorry, not the result, but this, the payload of this event plus the work items generated of it to the database. Now, what are the work items in this case? We talked about the fact that we want to take an event and do the aggregation. We want to take multiple events and do the aggregation, right? So if I have an event and I have means of detecting to which, like of detecting specific instance of an aggregate or maybe multiple aggregates that I want to project this event to, right? I want to be capable of building these work items. The work item is basically in this case, the mapping between my inbound event, my, the, uh, the instance of my aggregate that I want to project it onto and some additional information like in, in case of CDC, that would be log sequence numbers, but basically you want whatever you are consuming, you want to be capable of ordering these aggregates, um, sorry, this, uh, these work items uh, so that you could at least partially address the problem of out of order consumption, okay? So this is step one, which is, okay, let's consume and let's, um, you know, let's make sure that uh, we are um, writing the pending work to the local storage. So if we take a look at this guy, um, it registers two background workers like this. So one is for engine stuff, right? And the other one is for vehicle stuff. So we are saying, okay, this is what we are going to consume. This is what we're going to project onto. This is what we're going to consume. This is what we're going to project onto. So these are the background workers for the CDC consumption. Now let's um, take a look at um, how does this work? Um, while I'm getting this up and running, any questions that you'd like to discuss or maybe parts of code that you'd like to look into deeper? None. It sounds like it was either too confusing or everything's clear. I think we just need some time to process this <laughs> all information, you know? Sure, I get you. Um, I know it's a lot and um, I would encourage you to play around with the code base. I'm going to share the link to the repository later on. But while it's spinning up, I'd like to talk through the use case again, okay? Um, we said that we are, uh, let me get to the previous slides. Ah, sorry, here. So we said, this is what we have, okay? Now I want to build on the right side of this diagram, a few more components. I want to consume from these topics. And remember, these are topics which could have more than one partition. So typically you would be consuming from multiple streams. I want to get from these topics data, right? And I want to consume it somehow, which is in my case, I am going to get the event figure out to which aggregate entity I want to project it and don't project immediately, but persist the event and persist the work items, which is basically a mapping between the event and the aggregate I'm going to project onto. Persist all that into the database, okay? That's my step one, which is quite simple. If I fail to uh, consume and figure out on what to project, or I fail to store this, depending on what kind of um, error happened, like is it transient or not, um, I could play around with different policies. Like if it's a transient thing, I should probably retry, okay? Um, if it's non-transient, then I have options. Like I can just log a warning and, uh, you know, think of, writing the payload but not generating work items that's one option and then manually try to somehow reprocess this event later so it's kind of close to the dlq but not but not really that um, or i could just cause a stream stock which is okay i am not going to commit an offset to kafka i'm not going to acknowledge that i have processed this event which means that i won't be able to uh, process any any other event from the same partition of the same topic any further until I have this fixed. 
Again, this might be okay for you or might be not. Um, the granularity of the operation of the acknowledgement though is fairly simple. Like it's either you have an aggregate on which you can project already in your database. So you can find it by some kind of criteria like a UID or whatnot, or you don't have it yet, right? So you can figure out what kind of, like what kind of, what is the identifier of the aggregate based on the payload of the event that you have consumed. Usually this is something you know in advance. Like if I have an event and I want to project it onto something, I know how to map them all together by some kind of criteria. So this is what we are trying to do during this step one, find an event, figure out what kind of aggregate I should be projecting onto, and uh, we will just put it to the database and uh, wait for projection to happen in, in, uh, in another background thread. Let's get back to our um, dashboard. Let's see if we are working. So I'm going to check my monolithic database to make sure that it's not yielding again. It likes to mess with me during demos. Yeah, we don't have this problem so far. Uh, now let's go to the control center. Now we have um, these two topics, right, uh, which I showed you earlier. We do have, let's take a look at uh, partition zero. We do have some messages. So nothing changed from this um, left side, uh, from this standpoint, right? Everything's still here. But now I want to take a look at my um, local storage, which I am using Postgres. I'm not going to deep into details on how exactly I'm using it in, in uh, uh, so far, right? But we are using Postgres database, that's where um, we do this, these writes that I mentioned earlier in these workers, right? That's where I put my payloads and work items. So how do I know if anything works here? Um, we will do, I'll refresh this thing, and we will take a look at the CDC inbound event. That's where I will put the payloads. So let's do select. And here. So I do have payloads. That's good. I have source, I have the offset of the source, I have um, the event key, right? And I have a timestamp. Now, notice that the offsets are different. That's because of the different partitions. So I don't have one partition per topic, I have multiple of them. What else do I have here? I have some heaters, that's what I consume from the, um, from the, from the Kafka, basically, it's Kafka's heaters. And uh, mostly you'll find there uh, an monotonic, monoton monotonically incrementing integer that represents the amount of re retries of your consumer to consume the message. Uh, unless, of course, you're right, there is something else. I do have a flyway schema history. The flyway is a tool I'm using for uh, getting my migrations on top of the Postgres database. And this vehicle CDC work item is a table of the work items that belong to uh, aggregates of type vehicle. So let's do a select here and uh, see what do I have there. Okay. So here are the work items. That's how they look like. Important things to consider. UIDs, obviously, to make difference between them. Event UID, that's your reference to the CDC inbound event. Aggregate UID, this is what I figure out uh, as an identifier of a vehicle onto which I want to project. Now, these guys like change sequence number, log block offset, log block slot number, and then commit VLF sequence number. This VLF stands for virtual log file. Um, so these columns are basically um, the same values that you see here, they are just decomposed. So these values are in fact uh, a combination of three long values. Um, and they stand for um, the virtual log file uh, in the SQL server, the log block and log block slot number. It typically allows you to uniquely identify a record in the log. Um, now, I do use commit and um, change. That, uh, that's a commit and that's change, right? So you can have a single transaction where multiple things are being committed at the same time. They will share the same commit LSN log sequence number, which will have exactly the same values. As you can see right here, I have two rows that have exactly the same commit thing, right? 
Um, and you might also have the same change depending on what Debezium does for you. Uh, but usually if there is a transaction that does multiple things at the same t uh, multiple things at the same time, you will have them uh, different for different operations within the same transaction. So this change, uh, change LSNs, which is decomposed to the three numbers, will have will give you a way to order the change data capture stuff um, between them. The other way to work with the, with these with this data is with the event timestamp. That's what you can get from Debezium too. But the timestamp is probably not the best thing because you don't have a way to order. Um, uh, records that order changes that happen within the same transaction. But you can totally use it if, if that works for you. Um, and then I also have this next retry, retry counter and this processed at, right? So that's my work item, which is reference to event, reference to an aggregate that I want to work with, uh, something to order the aggregates, which is six columns in my case that represent the SQL server's uh, log sequence number. And then um, the event Unix CGC timestamp, mostly I use it for audit. Um, and rest of it is uh, timestamps of when we processed the work item and how many times we retried it and when I'm going to retry this next time. So that's, um, that's what we did so far. We managed to consume stuff from the Kafka topic and build up some kind of planned work, okay? Um, let me tear the whole thing down and um, let's, um, while it is getting down, I'm going to do git checkout step eight. Now step eight is, uh, whoops, git reset hard. My step nine is actually aggregation, right? So we talked about consumption, but now if we take a look at um, our program.cs, um, I'll hope that it will get refreshed soon. Um, okay, did I, yeah. Let me make sure that writer isn't messing with me. While it's loading, you can see that what was added to this container configuration is this add CDC aggregator background worker. So this background worker now uses the background worker that I showed you earlier, which is not Kafka's one. Um, this guy will use the pipeline and batches of work items. So remember we said that, okay, we do have the work items, right? Now I want to use these work items to actually project the data. That's my step two of the aggregation. I have tons of data in my database. I want to run another background worker process that will take batches from the database of the work items group them, order them, and project on a particular aggregate. Now, a lot of interesting questions are, could be asked here. Like, okay, what if, like, how do I pick a batch? Okay, what if I'm running with multiple replicas? How do I ensure that um, they do not step on each other's toes? Um, how do I make sure, like, how performant is this? Is there, any problem with IO? Is there a problem with the CPU, right? Um, so I'll try to answer them as we go. If you have any others, please pick up. I'll try to answer them too. Anyone? None so far, okay. So this is our background worker registration. I am using an extension method again. I'm adding a background worker with the work item type CDC projection work item, right? I am adding the data services. This is basically means of getting data from Postgres database. Um, I am adding them for, um, this is for the events. This is for work items that should be projected on this type of aggregate, which is in my case would be vehicle. Um, and this is outbox. So remember I said that whenever we did the state mutation of the aggregate, when we projected something on it, I want to also publish to a different topic. So this outbox is yet another table in my Postgres database to which I'm going to write the payloads that I want to publish to another Kafka topic. So these are my data services. Now this guy is default batch work item pipeline. What this is, is basically I am registering a pipeline with the context, which is work item batch context. So this context will hold 
a collection will hold the batches of work items. But remember that by default, when I'm starting the pipeline in my background worker, it, it has none of the workers inside of it. And I want my background worker to run until cancellation, right? To run forever. So into this pipeline, I'm going to add a few things. First is I'm going to register um, the um, work item batch handler. This is what something that knows how to work with, um, with my uh, batches of work items. I will add another step, which is with retry forever. This is something I showed you earlier, right here in the pipeline extensions. It adds a step to the pipeline that uh, registers Polly's policy called wait and retry forever async. And it simply tries to execute the same thing all over again. Um, so now if we take a look at this uh, configuration of the pipeline, this is your first part of the middlewares, right? Now this is ambient transaction. Remember I said that the aggregation and produce and uh, the persisting of the state uh, of the aggregate state mutation and the outbox uh, payload should happen within a transaction. If it's not, then the problem that you will face uh, is there are multiple problems that you will face, but um, one of them we have mentioned right here, which is whoops, uh, yeah, which is what if like in which order do I do I, do I work with uh, uh, writes, right? How, what do I do first? Write to the database or write to the, to the message broker? What if one of the writes fails? What if it's first one? What if it's second one? How do I recover from it, right? So that's what, what we are trying to address. Like, I don't want to worry about them failing. I want to write them both in the same transaction, make the writes atomic and get rid of so-called dual write problem. Um, I'm going to write within a transaction the result of the mutation and the outbox to the table, and then in the in the other background process, I'm going to publish it. So getting back to this, that's why we need this with MB, with a new ambient transaction, which is another part of middleware that opens a transaction scope, and then executes the next step in the pipeline. When we are done with it, it just completes the scope and disposes it afterwards. So whoops. Um, so getting back to the pipeline in work items batch context, remember I said that the batch at the beginning of the pipeline is empty. It doesn't have any work items. So now I want to fill it in hydrated with the work items, but moreover, I want to hydrate it with the work items on every retry. Like if I successfully pro processed some, the, the, some of the, uh, like if I successfully processed first batch, I want to take another one, right? So that will, that will happen within the next iteration, within the next retry. So this takes care of hydrating. It works with the work item data service. And the important thing here from the wording might be interesting for you all is how do I solve a problem of multiple uh, replicas of the same aggregation process acting on top of the same data source? How do I make sure that they are not stepping on each other's toes? This method suggests a solution, the name of it, which is we should be picking batches uh, by applying a distributed lock, right? You can do this in multiple ways. What I'm going to use is a uh, feature of Postgres, which is called advisory locking. And I'm going to apply an advisory lock um, on every aggregate unit that, that fits into the batch size that I'm selecting from the work items. This might be a bit tricky to fit in your, in, into, into, into the mind, but um, I will try to show the query. It's far from too trivial either. Uh, but the, the point is, I don't want to project on the same target into multiple different threads or rep or processes or replicas of the same aggregator, right? So what, what we are trying to do is we are trying to log the aggregate and enforce the uh, a single threaded projection of the events on, on the same uh, on the same aggregate. This will still perform just fine as long as you're locking just the aggregate that you're projecting onto. So again, this one is important. And then um, if we take a look at uh, the, whoops, uh, that's the default pipeline, right? Um, if you take a look at here, um, what happens is we are registering um, the the way to resolve various things 
right? But this one is something I suggest to, to think of, and I hope that name will suggest you why we are using this. This is an, an exponential back off. You could use a different one. And this back off provider will be used um, inside of the um, batch work item pipeline um, that will simply stop the processing if for some reason I have too many items in the uh, in my in one of my work items tables, okay. Um, I suggest you to think about why would we ever do this. Um, and then there is a default work item uh, handler for CDC work items. This guy is uh, handling the single work item single work item projection on the aggregate. So if we take a look at the code of this guy, all it does it finds the inbound event find something that can handle the projection based on what kind of inbound event we have uh, picked based on the work item, and then calls the handle method on the projection handler. We have um, this projection handler as a base one, right? We will have two implementations. One is projecting engines on the vehicle aggregate. The other is vehicles from the source database to the vehicle aggregate. And they will be fairly simple. We know we are working with the uh, Debezium payload, so we will just unwrap it, so deserialize JSON basically. We will do the item potency check, and then we will figure out what kind of operation was that. That's what Debezium gives you. Is it a create of a row? Is it a read of a row, which is a snapshot basically? Is it an update or a delete? And then handle them accordingly uh, for every kind of the event payload that we have consumed. So say my engine, a projection handler will say, okay, I know how to handle create of a row in the source database, which creates a row dedicated for engines, right? Um, it will take the payload, parse it to the engine model, and then it will find the uh, vehicle if it wasn't created yet. This is the, my target, uh, my projection target, my aggregate, right? And it will basically change the state of this um, projection target. And additionally, it will say, okay, if my state is cohesive, which means like if my state is good enough to project somewhere, I'm going to create a payload of the event, this guy. And then when I have it, I'm going to build up a change log of sorts, a message that tells that I'm going to actually right to the outbox table, right? This is an event and the change log is basically a wrapper for it. I will show that hopefully still today. And this change log is going to be published, right? But how do I publish it? I am using the same idea as with aggregation. I am going to generate pending work basically for another background worker, which will bind the, which will basically store both the outbox payload and the data that I need to order the payloads um, for for every aggregate, which is, which would be a timestamp, and then the the other background worker will pick them up and produce them to a Kafka topic. So let's see if this works. I know that we are almost out of time, so I'll have to skip parts of it. Um, sorry for that. Get status. Uh, oops, not that. I need to do tie run. Whoops, not rub run. While it's running, I know it's a lot of information. Um, while we are spinning this up, any questions or things you'd like to uh, to discuss? None. I even had to check if we still have someone on the call. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so with that in mind, while it's still bringing stuff up, I'd like to... Sorry, we, yep. we definitely need part three. <laughs> I know it's a lot, and I'm um, unfortunately bound to hour and a half. So <laughs> um, while it's uh, getting up and running, um, I'll try to show you the distributed locking thing.
this pick a batch with distro lock. Remember I said that I want to make sure that I'm projecting on the same aggregate uh, only in one, one of the replicas. And I do that in a uh, single threaded manner. Why do I need this? Because if it's executed on multiple replicas, it's stepping on each other's toes and you're getting a race condition. You want to get rid of it. If, uh, why don't we try to project into multiple threads? Because again, this introduces a race condition and you have to somehow handle concurrency, which means that likely it's not the greatest idea to project on the same aggregate into different processes or threads or whatever. So I want to lock an aggregate so that any, like none of the other replicas of my process could try to do the same projection. And the way I do this here is quite um, complex, which is I'm using a select from a table valued function by specifying for it two parameters, which is work items, batch size and scale factor. Now, I also specify an aggregate type because if I'm working with more than one aggregate in the same aggregator process, I want to make a difference between the work items, right? But what this thing is, um, let me see if I can find it in the flyway. Yep, this table valued function is again, far from trivial, right? Lots of code, but what it does in, in a few words, it selects data from my CDC work items that I have created on the step one when I acknowledge the event, but it selects them in a special way. It filters out delayed processing, those that have a retry, uh, which is non-zero and next retry timestamp somewhere in the future, okay? It also checks if there are locked aggregates. The way I lock the aggregates is an advisory lock. This is Postgres thing and I other RDB, RDBMSs have similar approach of applying application level locking basically. I don't want to lock the row. I want to lock something more than a row. And the best way I can come up with, you know, letting Postgres know what, what is that is, okay, there is some, some kind of lock synchronization object, right? That I want you to keep locked and do not everyone, do not let anyone else to get a hold of a lock for it. So um, the way we apply this lock is uh, using this PG try advisory X, X act lock. Um, this is Postgres function that allows you to place an advisory lock. This X, there are several functions that work with advisory locks. This exact means that you are using lock that is automatically released at the end of the transaction. So remember we had the transactional scope. It is being open for the period of time when, while we are doing the, the projection, right? So this lock will hold until this scope is committed or rolled back. Now I want to filter out locked aggregates. I will be able to do that if I look into PG locks table. This is Postgres internal table that holds a, uh, a record of every single lock that happens in the system. Right, And the way I filter out logs from there is by keys that I have specified in here. So basically I'm saying, okay, filter out whatever failed and has to be processed later, filter out whatever is already locked, right? And then from everything else, give me a batch of items, but make sure to order them by the six columns I have showed you earlier as a criteria for, uh, for ordering across the work items. They are based on the log sequence number. So now I have a batch that can be spanned across multiple aggregates, but um, I have all the aggregates blocked like through the advisory lock. And as long as all my replicas are using the same advisory locking mechanism, it's safe to work with that aggregate. It's not like row locked yet. So you can do the projection, you can change the state, you can update, you can do whatever you need. It reduces lock contention on top of it. And uh, it prevents other replicas to operate in the same aggregates. Um, and then I do have this batch right now, right? And I still hold the logs. So in my aggregator replica, I can go ahead and do the projection, okay? Safely knowing that no one else is going to cause me trouble using race conditions or whatever else. Now let's take a look at um, uh, how our tie is feeling itself today. Um, let me check my monolithic database again. 
don't want any yielding anymore. Okay, we're good. So now if we take a look at the PG admin and refresh a collection of the tables, um, you will notice here that there is a, whoops, I think I forgot to pick the correct, um, let me see if I do have a correct commit checked out. I should have. Um, work items, vehicle, okay. Let's see. Confluent, show me 44, and that's okay. And uh, my Postgres database, Flyway, I want to see what Flyway says. Flyway says that there is a connection error. So let me clear the log and find my Postgres database, which should be, um, where do I have it? Ah, here it is. And it's down because of what? Ah, I do have a problem with the port being already allocated. So hold on. Sometimes Ty has a problem of cleaning up after itself. So let me stop this. Um, I hope you guys have another like five minutes. Um, I hope to fit that rest of the demo into it. Let's see what's going on with the containers. We'll have to wait until it cleans up. And you know what? I'm going to check out next um, step eight, which will do publishing as well, so that I can um, make sure that I'm not stealing too much of your time today. Okay, this guy should be cleaned up. Okay. All right, Tyron. While it's running, I'll switch back to the code base and show you what, what have changed. Um, in the program.cs, right? In addition to my uh, configuration that added an aggregator background worker, I have another uh, registration. This is registering a polling publisher. Again, this is a background worker, which works with the work items of, the same, of, of a different type. So I'm still using the same background worker, just a different kind of work items. This change is basically an event wrapper. It's a protobuf, it's auto-generated code. Um, and uh, it's typically a message that I'm going to publish, right? To a different topic. So if we go to the um, protobuf, uh, I think I have it somewhere. Um, do, do, do. Docker flyway protobuf here. So here is my, um, that's value object, that's the aggregate. So here is my aggregate. That's the contract that I was trying to build, right? It has vehicle you like it tells you what kind of vehicle it is, and it also has an engine object underneath it. And the change, that's the wrapper. This wrapper is something that I would suggest you do whenever you are working with uh, event streaming, which is defined as a, a standard for at least majority of the uh, of the events that you are send like shuffling around, which is um, in my mind, the, the good option is using a resulting state of the entity, giving the uh, event payload, um, which gives you an operational context, tell you the revision number and uh, tell you when the change happened. Now, when the change happened, be careful with this. It's, um, it might be either a change in the source, uh, in the source of truth, or it could be a processing time. Better to pick first one as it gets that's away from the ambiguity, um, but this is probably a topic for a different talk. Anyways, going back to um, like, that's the change that we're going to um, to emit, uh, to produce to, to a Kafka topic. And so again, we're registering default batch work item pipeline um, into it. Uh, we're going to register a bunch of stuff to, to, this, to 
the ISC container, which is Kafka producer, uh, change serializers, um, and uh, something that knows how to how to publish the thing, like how to use the producer. Um, and then again, back off providers um, and uh, something that knows how to work with the outbox work item, each individual one, right? And then with all that being said, um, this background worker will simply be um, using this default batch work item pipeline, which is again, the retry forever, ambient transaction, and hydration for the for the pipe for the context, right? So we are using the same pipeline, different generic parameters, nothing new there. Right. So getting back, let's see if my uh, tie dashboard is up and running now. Okay, I do have two replicas, one, one, one. Okay, everything seems okay here. So now if I go to the cluster, notice that I have 45 topics right now, and this one is a new one. Okay. So let's take a look at what goes, what's going on with the messages here. And if I'm, if I'm publishing something, apparently I do, right? However, I do publish something like gibberish, right? The reason why is protobuf gets serialized into binary. That's why right here, you can see, you know, readable message. You can configure though your Confluence control center so that it knows how to deserialize it. But I didn't do that. Instead, we're going to see what exactly we have published through the PG admin. If I refresh this guy, I can see a bunch of new stuff, right? And that's the vehicle table. That's where I keep my aggregates. So if I do script select, and if I do a select, I can see two payloads. I'm, I'm just storing JSON payloads. You can store them in a uh, normalized way. It doesn't really matter. But if you take a look at this JSON blob, you'll see that, hey, here's the state of my aggregate and that's vehicle. It has a model, it has an engine, it has unit and a year of manufacture, right? And that's pretty much the state of all the aggregates. So I kind of have a proof that I am aggregating with the approach that I said. Now, what, what about publishing to the outboxes? Let's take a peek into outbox table. So the outbox work items, uh, let's do select again. Now, here's, what's, here's what it is. Um, no LSNs, no more, right? I am using a timestamp. And again, it's long um, for the sake of, you know, uh, unification and making sure that we're not messing up with the time zones. But this is basically amount of milliseconds from the Unix, time, from the Unix epoch. Um, now, retry counters, right? I managed to handle everything without exceptions, which, um, you know, saves me a lot of trouble. And now this guy is a payload which I'm going to publish and which you saw in the Kafka topic. Now you can see that you have there an event. This one is a serialized protobuf, right? This time protobuf is serialized to the JSON instead of binary for the sake of maintainability so, they can, so that I can see what's happening in, in uh, my outbox table and read this in a good way, right? Here is the resulting state, which is the same kind of model that we saw earlier. That's my vehicle, okay? Here's the timestamp when the change happened. So that's how my outbox looks like. Now this outbox Unix, Unix timestamp is important because you want to be capable of ordering these guys. So if I have multiple work items for the same UID, uh, sorry, for the same aggregate UID, like these two, right? I want to be able to order them and publish them in the order um, that I, I in the same order in which the change happened in the source database, or worst case, um, at least in the order I did the projection uh, in, in my aggregator, right? So that's why I need this guy. That's why I need these timestamps. That's uh, pretty much it. I know that I didn't fit everything that I wanted to show you into this presentation, but um, I'm hoping that it was nevertheless interesting. If you have any questions, um, just shoot them.